Welcome to the podcast, the destination for insightful discussions and interviews on the appreciation, conservation, and husbandry of reptiles with a focus on turtles and tortoises. Now, let's join our team of turtle nerds. Can he hear us? Can he hear us? He looks frozen. Steve had a brownout, everyone. Oh, we're live. We're live. Steve, they're saying we're live. We are live. It happened. We're live. We're live. Yes, Sweet we are yay. live. We are back and better Hello. than ever, ladies and gentlemen. We are oh. here with Podcast. Podcast episode 72. I'm ignoring Steve in my ear. I think no one else can hear him. So the guy, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Uh, we had a little issue with the roll-in and getting started tonight. But we just kept on trucking like we always do. Uh, this is episode 72, if you're wondering, if you're keeping track at home. Really excited about that. Uh, we're excited about our guest tonight. We have Christine Light with us, who is absolutely wonderful. Um, Chris and I had the opportunity Aww. to... You really are. You really are. Cr Aww, Chris and I had the opportunity to, to hear you speak in person. Come on, Chris. You're a professional. I know. Right? Get it together. <laughs> I was like, wow, I'm not screwing up. And then, mm. no, somebody in Albuquerque needs a Herman's tortoise, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> no biggie. No, but but Chris and I were able to go out to the TTPG conference in, in 2018 and see you speak. And you were just incredible. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I don't know what that. you're supposed to say to that besides just like that. Yeah, yeah okay. I mean, I'm not. Now I'm, it made it awkward. There were some really good talks at that conference, but. And I'm not just saying this because you're right here in front of us, but that was definitely sure my, you're not. No, seriously, it, it was my okay. favorite. It was definitely my favorite. It was so oh, awesome. awesome. Well, thank and, you. And thank moving, you. and I, you know, like I, I, I couldn't even recite all the you know ins and outs and that sort of thing. But it's like the Maya Angelou quote: "Like you remember how people make you feel." I just remember sitting in my seat and being so inspired hearing you talk and be like, "Why?" Don't I know this person better and and everything? And and this is what I wanted to lead with because you guys, were you're looking. Gonna, you're gonna make me cry, guys. <laughs> this, that's the goal. That's the goal. Okay. But I remember sitting there and okay, let me take you back to 2018, Anthony, for a second. Okay, this is an important part of telling the story. <clears throat> so, Andrew Hermes helped me get to the conference because, like, I didn't even know where it was coming from. Like, I have two young kids and I was trying to like rub some pennies together and make it happen. Andrew's like, don't even worry. I'll help you out with your travel, like whatever. Um, because he wanted to, to have us there or whatever, which was incredible. He's so selfless and, and it was awesome. And fast forward, um, I was in a little bit of a different situation when the conference actually started. I had a couple dollars in my pocket, which was a really nice feeling. And they were burning a hole in my pocket by that point. But you asked people for support for the amazing work you were doing. And I had, just yes. had someone help me get to the conference because that's what type of situation I was in. And I held my dollar bill in the air. It was a hundred dollar bill actually, because I was yeah. so moved. Like I did not have it afterwards. I was like, that was pretty dumb, but I, but I wouldn't take it back in a second. <laughs> so I was just so moved by what you were I'll doing. I'll mail you a check. I'll mail so, you. so can we start there? Actually, it was Will, uh, Will Espen. It was Will Espen Shade. Oh yeah. yes. Yes. It was he said, Will Espen Shade. He said, I have whatever. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And he yeah, said, he up there on the he... podium and he said, who want, who yeah. can match this, whatever. And half of us were like, yes. oh man, now, you know, but, <laughs> but yeah, you know, like we went to, uh, yeah, Anthony threw that, threw that hundred up there. And so did Andrew. Andrew gave a hundred dollars yes. as well. Yes. And I was just yeah. super proud yeah. moment, but, but an awesome moment. And it was, it was just so moving. So could we start, I, instead of going with the cliche, like tell us about your start in reptiles or conservation or, or turtles. Can can we start with kind of just the the work you were doing, uh, um, the work you are doing, and and kind of what you were talking about in 2018, just to kind of uh, let people know what we know. Yeah, sure. So um, so I started working at the Turtle Conservancy in 2013, and uh, I was there for about six months, and um, I got the stud book for the Forsten's tortoise, and 
this was my first time actually working with turtles. I mean, I had worked with sea turtles in the past. I had worked with um, a painted terrapin that I rehabbed in um, in Denver. And we should talk about that as well, because that's basically why I'm, I'm in turtle conservation. But anyway, um, so I, I got the stud book for Forrest and I and didn't really know much about them. So, uh, you know, went online, wanted to do some research about uh, the wild population. And literally there was nothing. You know, there was a little bit of work that um, Chris Hagen had done and Steve Platt. Steve Platt had done some work, but, oh, and, and um, Ian Ives also had done some work. But this is like, you know, I don't know, um, 15 or 10 years ago. So I'm, this is now 2013. So yeah, maybe 2005, um, Ian had done some work and Steve had done some work in 2007, I think it was. But other than that, there was no information at all. So it was also an SSP, um, it's an SSP species. So, you know, one of the requirements is that you set goals as, uh, mm -hmm. as the SSP coordinator. So one of my goals was to, um, you know, to, to start a uh, in situ project with Forsten's tortoises. So, um, yeah, so basically kind of started maybe you know, kind of thought about it in 2014, 2015. And then um, in 2016, sort of, oh, I know, it was the TSA conference in 2015. So I was talking to a couple people, um, you know, about starting this project, how I can get things going. And bear in mind, I had never done a project like this. I had never even really done field work, but I kind of get something in my head and I'm just like, I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so just talking to a couple of people at the conference, um, Peter Paul Van Dyke, I talked to uh, Anders Rodin, and I came back from the conference and was just super motivated. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. So just got a, you know, a team together. Um, Craig Stanford was on the team, uh, Andrea Currylow, and um, so the project, yeah, sort of started at the conference in 2015, and then, um, you know, 2016 is... Uh, you know, was my first trip to Sulawesi. So, um, yeah, it's been a lot of ups and downs. I could spend probably hours <laughs> just talking about, uh, you know, talking about Sulawesi, but, um, yeah. So. That's, that's so cool. I think for people who are like, um, s students of the game or fans or whatever, so to speak, Chris, you could always mute yourself if you want. Um, you know, we, <laughs> We um, like to hear about kind of the ins and outs of how that stuff works, right? So so when you say like you had the opportunity to actually go to Sulawesi, um, fourth largest island in Indonesia for anyone who's keeping track and and home to two iconic uh, endemic species, the Forstens tortoise and, yeah. and um, uh, the Sulawesi forest turtle, um, Yuanawai. Uh, better known as you want to why. Um, so when you're actually setting that up and trying to spearhead something like that, like what actually come goes into that? Because I don't think that that, like you don't see that part. Like I, for some reason I've been watching the crocodile hunter a lot lately, old reruns like at, at night with my kids. Cause it's like relatively family friendly, although they probably have crocodile nightmares. Um, but you don't hear like what actually goes into like, okay, who are you talking to to set up these trips, the partnerships you're making? How do you find the funding right. to get over there? That sort of thing. Cause you, could you speak a little bit about what, what it's like to set those up sure. without giving yeah. away all so your tricks? Yeah. Well, it's extremely difficult, especially in a country like Indonesia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you need a permit, first of all, a research permit you also need a local counterpart. So a Western biologist, um, you know, can't just come into Sulawesi or, or Indonesia in general to do research on their own. So you need to partner up with local, um, you know, usually a local university, um, a, a LIPI, which is their research institute, um, but it's usually university. So, um, gosh, I'm trying to think back what I did. So. Um, Yes, yeah, so we planned this trip and it was sort of a reconnaissance trip because I didn't have a permit. And technically we had to be very careful about what we did. You know, we couldn't really post photos of us with any turtles that we found um, because it would be considered, uh, you know, actually doing research. So um, I got a local guide who was a biologist, a biology student, and, 
and he went along on the trip with us and you know we just set up a bunch of meetings with uh, the local universities and um, it's actually a, a university in Sulawesi that Chris Hagen had presented at back in 2000 I think 2011 and literally Forston's tortoise uh, habitat is right outside their university and they didn't even know that the tortoise existed there so you know i did build off a lot of information that chris had already done and also steve platt had already done so i got a lot of contacts through them so you know we met with this university they became our uh, one of our counterparts for the project um we also got another counterpart in um uh, uh, bogor university which is um in west java and so now we have our counterparts now it's the process of getting a permit Everyone told me that I'd never get the permit because it was extremely difficult to get a research permit in Indonesia. It took about, I'm going to say it took about a year to finally get the permit between, you know, the letters that you needed and, you know, these different size photos on red background for your permit. And um, it was insane trying to get the permit. So finally got we, you know, I was successful in getting the permit. And at that time, Andrea Carillo was also on the project. So uh, we got the permit jointly. Um, and that was a huge step, getting the permit to work in Indonesia. You know, everyone was just like, good luck. That's it's going to be really, really difficult. So I felt like once I got the permit, I was, you know, kind of on my way to, um, you know, to getting this project going. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I have, and I have then, an and then, question for the permit oh, yeah. when you get a chance. No, go ahead, please. Yeah. Oh, no, go ahead. All right. I was just going to say, uh, Indonesia has like over 17,000 islands. How does the government like manage that as far? I, I know you don't know the in-depth details, but how could they manage it? Say you went to a different island that you put on your permit. How would they even know? Well, I mean, you have a little card that you're mm -hmm. technically supposed to carry around with you. And it specifically says you know, where you're doing research. There was like a 10 page document that I also had to carry okay. around with me. Um, and I know a few institutions that actually have done research in Indonesia without a permit and they're banned right now from wow, okay. ever doing research in the country. So really? I wow. definitely wasn't going to do any, yeah, yeah. I definitely wasn't going to do anything that, you know, was going to harm, um, you know, me keeping this permit. And also, so once, oh, sorry. No, 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 you keep going. I'll, I'll ask when you're oh, done. So, so once I got the permit, I had to travel to Indonesia. I spent, I think, three days in Jakarta at the ministry getting all the documentation. Then I had to spend another, like, three days down in Bogor at immigration to get all the paperwork done down there. So it was about a week, five to seven days process to actually physically you know complete the the permit process so it was extremely difficult <laughs> yeah did they um did, you know the way the permit works did, did it was it like a certain allotted amount of time and a certain time of year that you could be there or was it you know it's the year so, 2020 and you can go anytime in this year so i requested for five years and they gave me oh, a wow. permit for a year uh -huh. So I, but every year I had to renew it. Right. I forgot I also had to go to immigration in um, in Los Angeles to actually have this um, <clears throat> special visa put into my um, my passport. Okay. So they had to like you know print it into the passport. So I had to drive down to LA. Um, I live in Ventura, so it's you know like two hours sometimes. Drop my passport off, and then I had to go back like. I think it was five days. It took like five days for them to complete that process. So then I had a, a visa in my passport. And that's what I had to show when I went, you know, when I went to customs and immigration at, in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then every year I was supposed to renew, um, you know, renew my, uh, my permit. And you, you know, I had to present, one of my counterparts actually presented to the government there um, you know, you have to present your results every, mm -hmm. I, th I think I had to do quarterly updates. So I had to send, you know, quarterly updates on the project to the Indonesian government, um, you know, while I had the permit. Yeah. Wow. That's that was the, probably the most difficult part. 
<laughs> the wow. most difficult part about the whole process. Yeah. Yeah. Even just getting yourself there, like you're a true wildlife warrior, like working so hard to make this happen. I think that's why I wanted to kind of ask and kind of tease that out a little bit because that's something that I think people don't realize. A lot of people reach out all the time, you know, I want to get involved in conservation and I want to do this and like what it actually looks like even to just get boots on the ground mm -hmm. for actual conservation work yeah. is, is so incredible. That's, yeah. that's wild. Speaking of getting there, um, you know, and I, I recall a conversation that we had had with uh, Maurice Rodriguez a couple of years ago, or at least I did. I, I don't know if you were in on it, Anthony, but he had spoke about, you know, depending on where you're going in the world, the kinds of vaccinations you have to get to uh, to protect you from certain things that, you know, there. Did you have to go through anything like that to, to make sure you were safe? Um, you know, I didn't get I didn't get anything. Mm -hmm. um, I did take <laughs> malaria. I did. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I'll be fine. Yeah, yeah I'll be fine. Yeah. Um, I didn't take. Um, I, I did take malaria malaria jugs, but mm -hmm. I think it was my second trip. I had one of my bags stolen at the airport, and my malaria drugs were were in the bag. So oh, my second trip, I you know I didn't take them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I kind of. I don't think there were any. I don't think there were any vaccines that I actually needed. Um, okay. They did recommend malaria drugs, but like mm -hmm. I said, you know, I took them one trip and they were expensive too, you know, the ones that I got. So I was just like, eh, you know, I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be fine. Mm -hmm. I didn't get malaria. A lot of other things happened to me, but malaria wasn't one of them. Wow. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about some of the other things that happened to you? Like the, was it, what is that called? The jackfruit or something that Durian? fell in your head? Oh my goodness. Can we talk yeah. about, I remember that. I remember Do seeing that on to... social media. Can we get a photo of that yeah. to show people what we're talking about? This thing you have to show yeah. The, the, yeah, the three photos, actually, because one of them's really, well, the one, the one of me, um, and then there's two uh, of my head. <laughs> so, yes, okay, so we're in, wow. um, you know, force. So, okay, who do I look like in that picture? Do I not look like Matt Patterson in that picture? <laughs> 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 I like I wish I had a picture of Matt so we can kind of put it side by side. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So that's okay, so that is the um the durian that hit me in the head. And so we're we're in Forest and I habitat working with this this one family and um there were like maybe five of us and we're walking, you know, under all these durian trees and they're like 15 to 20 feet tall these trees. And I don't know, we stopped for something to talk or to look at something. And all of a sudden, just like everything goes, you know, I can't see anything. And I just hear everyone screaming in, in Bahasa and in Indonesian. And the only word I can make out is durian. So somebody comes over, they're like, lay down, lay down. And so I, I lay down and there's just like, you know, blood, um, you know, like in my eyes and wow. my glasses are broken. Oh, um, so yeah, so a, a, that durian fell from a tree. I don't know how high. And um, yeah, it like hit me. I guess it must hit me like right, you know, above my forehead. Luckily, I had glasses on because it, they probably could have taken an eye out. And um, yeah. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty intense, and that happened luckily towards the end of my trip, so I didn't have mm -hmm. to you know right. deal with that for you know for the whole trip. But I mean, I didn't take a photo, but I had this you know my eye was all swollen. I had this giant black eye, and I remember going so, um, and we were far too. Like we had to walk a pretty long distance to get back to sort of civilization. Um, so I remember the guy who owns the farm that we were on, um, you know, he got his little motorbike and I'm on the back of the motorbike and he takes me to the nurse and, um, I, you know, I'd taken, I had studied Bahasa for like two years, but I mean, I'm by no means fluent. Um, so, you know, that they're talking and I'm thinking I'm going to die. I don't know. You know, I mean, who knows what, what's going on? And, um, you know, she, finally she gave me the thumbs up and she's like, no, you're okay. You know, you're going to be okay. And, uh, you know, they put, they cleaned it up. They put some ointment on it and gave me some, um, antibiotics and it cost her like a dollar, I think like a dollar 40 us <laughs> to, <laughs> to get all that. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was pretty funny. Yeah. So, um, oh my gosh. yeah, I, I got hit in the head with a durian. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, you know, I, my, <laughs> 
my my wife doesn't want me to travel. So last year I was supposed to go to China and she didn't really let me go. She said, Oh, you can go next year. And then the pandemic happened. So that didn't happen. But she's, she's convinced that I'm the person that will have a durian land on my forehead. No, so you, you would, you wouldn't even look, you'd catch it. You I think. don't. <laughs> I yeah. think you would just bump into it as you were walking. Yeah, you tall. would. That too. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. That wouldn't happen to you. Yeah. Yeah, know, you just I'm put tall. your hand up and, and you'd catch it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I didn't tell like when it happened. I didn't tell my mom. Right, uh, my right, because of course, be freaked out every time you went in the future. Yeah. Oh my That's gosh. crazy. Anthony's yeah. the kind of guy that would grab yeah. the fruit and hand it a dollar forty and say, "Nice try." No, that's not true. I would die on impact. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I would. Die on impact. Have you guys? Have you guys ever tasted durian? No, is it good? Have you guys ever I smelled did. or tasted durian? No. I didn't oh, know what it was until you said awful. it. Awful. Really? Wow. I just look at. The okay, theater. so it's it's sort of like it's sort of like this weird. You, should, you guys should Google it. It's sort of like this weird garlicky tasting fruit, and it's actually banned. Like you're not allowed to bring it into any hotels because it smells so bad. It smells wow. like rotting flesh. Yeah, oh. it's awful. So I had never Let's tasted it, but everyone, yeah. you know, and you know, they love it. It's like, everyone loves it over there. So, you know, they were just like, well, you have to eat the one that hit you. You know, I mean, you have to like conquer, you know, oh. conquer the durian. And I tried some and it was, ugh, tasted disgusting. I was going to ask yeah. if there was any to... superstitious stuff around that. Like if you, if, if it was good luck to get hit with a, with a durian, like, like it's good luck for a seagull to poop on you here. <laughs> yeah. yeah um I, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy yeah maybe oh. my worst enemy but <laughs> yeah yeah i just um yeah it was um it was intense i mean how, you know how many well you know people who do work like in durian um you know picking durians they do wear hard hats and i said that you know next time i go back if i go to this area i'm definitely um gonna wear a hard hat yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, people have gotten killed by um, uh, coconuts, you know, because, I mean, coconuts get, you know, enormous or even jackfruit, like jackfruit gets, I don't know, three or four times bigger than durian, but durian has little spikes on it. So I don't know if you could like see in that yeah. picture, but there's like, yeah, yeah. So there's little spikes. And I, thought, I like, thought jackfruits had the spikes. No, jackfruit is sort of like little, like little nubs, you know, it's mm. kind of smooth. Mm. Um, but durian has spikes. So it, yeah, it basically just like slid down my face and, it, you know, wow. yeah, it was, it was not pretty. It was, yeah, it was awful. A little side. <laughs> I've always gotten everybody. hurt. Every time I go to Sulawesi, something happens. <laughs> hey, what? Uh, a side fact for everybody. There are 30 recognized durio species. So you got hit by one out of 30. Oh, you're sick. Wow. You got, you got 29 and more tries. I did, I did not know that. Wow. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. And actually, mine was fairly small, which is a good thing, because I think if it was bigger, I mean, all joking aside, I mean, I, I could have possibly, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. died. I could have died. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So I can so laugh you, about it now, but it wasn't, do you funny. Feel, it wasn't funny then. After that happens, do you feel like... Like I can conquer anything. I'm really lucky and I'm ready to save the world for turtles. Or do you feel like, man, maybe this is a sign that I shouldn't be working so hard and trying to, you know, shatter glass ceilings and turtle conservation or whatever. Like, what are you thinking after that? I mean, after the durian, it, it, it did take me down a notch a little bit. I was just like, oh, I'm too old for this. What am I thinking? <laughs> you know? And Yeah. But, but, you know, I, I, I got out of that. But right after it happened, I was just like, I, I could be home, you know, on my couch, <laughs> you know, watching TV, you know. But, um, but, but you know, my mind changed after that. But, uh, yeah, it was sort of, I think, I mean, I've, I've fallen in Sulawesi. You know, I've hurt my knee. Um, I'm kind of clumsy. I, I, I fall a lot. So, you know, we're in these like uh, doing night surveys for Uwanawai in these like really fast flowing streams um, in the dark, you know, cause it, it's at night and I, I can't count how many times I've fallen and, mm. you know, and, and that was fine. Cause I'm used to it. You know, I'm used to being clumsy. Um, but the durian was sort of, yeah, 
Because, I mean, nobody even there had ever heard of anybody else getting hit in the head with a durian. Wow. But here, yeah. come, here comes Christine, you know, from, you know, <laughs> we little tall white girl from, you know, from California. And, uh, yeah, she gets hit in the head with a durian. So I was thinking, maybe this isn't my calling. So, yeah. Can you, um, speaking of the durian and, and, you know, it's clearly has something to do with the habitat. Can you talk more about the specifics of this habitat, what it was like to try to move through them? Because we're, we're talking of uh, just for the, so the viewers know for Sulawesi, we're talking about two different colonians here that you're after, correct? Forston's tortoise and the Sulawesi yes. forest turtle. So can you, you right. can you tell us a little bit more, especially for myself, I'm always very curious about what these locations are like and to try to actually move through them because they're so untouched compared to, you know, the United States, for example, right? All right, exactly. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't include any photos of the habitat. I have some no, really no, cool ones. Fine. But so, um, you know, obviously, you want to know why we were looking for just at night. So, um, uh, it's pretty fast flowing streams. There are some spots, you know, maybe knee high, other spots, you know, sort of like up to your ankles, very, very rocky. Um, very slippery, you know, a lot of algae. Um, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't as hard to find Uanawai. Um, you know, they, well, I was with guides and they found them all the time. So obviously they were spotting them left and right. You know, mm -hmm. we, we had no problems finding Uanawai. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, a cooler water. Um, I'm trying to I remember we took temperatures like maybe, um, it, you know, low 70s, uh, you know, 70s was the water. Uh, very clear, you know, very clear streams. Um, now, forced and, 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 you know, flat. So, you know, you're not climbing up any hills, you know, or, or you know, any mountains to get to uh, forced and I habitat. Mm -hmm. Forced and I, on the other hand, yes, very, very difficult. Um, it, you know, tons of canopy, uh, you know, a lot of brush to cut through, um, higher altitude. So you're you know, you're, you're climbing these pretty steep, um, you know, pretty steep hills. And, wow. um, yeah, I don't know if I, I don't think I've mentioned yet, but, um, you know, my, I'm not a field biologist, you know, that was not, you know, not my background. So, um, I also am a city girl. I grew up in New York. I went to, you know, high school and college in New York. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I never really did a lot of hiking, <laughs> you know, or a, lo or yeah. a lot of, um, you know, her herping, things like that. So, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think I, I picked probably, you know, one of the hardest places to work and, and <laughs> you know, the hardest habitat to, you know, to maneuver through. And yeah, I don't know what I was thinking, but um, yeah, for me, Forrest and I, looking for Forrest and I was really difficult, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of getting up those hills and super hot, you know, it's really hot, it's really humid. Um, and then trying to find Forrest and I is, uh, you know, I remember you. Impossible. I remember you talking about that, you know, um, when you did your talk at TTPG, and how uh, it, it, you know, it's that much of a big deal to locate any of them. Oh. Sorry, you broke up a little bit there, Chris. Oh, there. I said I, re I remember you uh, at your talk um, for TTPG. I remember you speaking about how difficult it was to find them, and then you know if when that does happen, it's, you know, that big of a deal because they're basically unseen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, you know, Chris and I, Chris Hagen and I were, um, the, the first Western biologist, you know, documented to see Forrest and I in the wild. Um, I remember, well, okay. So we didn't find the Forrest and I, um, you know, obviously our guide, you know, who knows where to look, he found him. Um, but I remember him calling out that he found one and I just remember like literally running, <laughs> you know, running through the trees and, um, you know, cactus as well. There's a lot of cactus there, you know, invasive, uh, like a puntia cactus. Mm -hmm. And I remember my backpack getting caught on, um, on some of the branches and I just didn't care. You know, my backpack went flying and I just, you know, I wanted to be like the first person to see this, you know, Forston's tortoise that, yeah. you, you know, I had wanted to find. And this was, um, when did Chris and I go last February, not this past February, the February before. So 2000, what was that? 2019? Yeah. Right? Beginning yeah of 2019. 2019. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was my fourth trip there. 
and um, yeah, you know, never found a Borson's tortoise. So obviously, you know, that's really, you know, was what I wanted, you know, wanted to see. And um, yeah, so this Borson's tortoise was, you know, in this um, just mess of uh, branches. And, and I mean, you would never know unless you knew where to look. Right, right. You know, so, so the guy. Yeah. I mean, I would have walked right by it. Um, but the guide left it, you know, he let me, um, it, you know, kind of take it out of, of the its hiding space. And I mean, I, I think that in that photo, I'm, I mean, I know I was crying, <laughs> you know, because I mean, it was just like the, the most exciting thing that sure. you know, happened to me was to find this, you know, find this tortoise. Um, sorry, I don't even remember your question now. <laughs> I don't, I don't even, answer know, it. Chris, I don't even remember the question you were asking. Yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know I got so excited about the horse and tortoise. I don't even, yeah. <laughs> I have um, a question. That, that was so... one of my things that I remembered from the talk clearly was, yeah. okay. and the emotion was captured in that, you know, uh, in, in, you know what it almost kind of reminded me of, and I'm sure you guys can attest to this, is, you know, way, way less of a scale in terms of big deals, but kind of like, you know, just the first time you know, you witness any of these animals in the wild going all the way back to your childhood, like the first time you maybe walk, you know, stumble across a box turtle in your backyard. It's just such an epic moment. But the species that you're dealing yeah. with and the the lengths that you went to to go there to see it, like I remember that moment of the talk just being like, yeah, you know, like it, it's awesome. Yeah. 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 It was, it, it made the durian is, you know, episode a little bit more bearable that I, you know, finally was able to see, uh, to see a forced deny in the wild. That's incredible. Uh, yeah. Some, no, can some I... bad news. So, yeah. Go ahead. go ahead, please. Well, so, you know, unfortunately the, the guy that we were working with who, you know, took us out to find this forest um, you know, we thought we could work with him and, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we saw on Facebook that he actually went out a couple, I don't know, a week or so later and actually collected that tortoise. Cause you know, we processed it. We, um, you know, we, we, uh, weighed it, measured it, we notched it. Um, you know, it was the first, uh, Forstens that we, you know, that we found and pretty sure that he went out and collected it and, and, and sold it. So really? yeah, kind of a downer. Yeah. I didn't mean to put a downer on the whole, yeah, the whole thing, but wow. what leads you to that? Yeah. He's a you? Huge, huge. Yeah. Collector. How did you find out about that? No. Uh, so someone sent me a photo. Um, I think it was, um, I can't remember who sent it, um, of, uh, like on, from his Facebook page, this guy's Facebook page. And it looked like the tortoise was notched. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, I can't, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but you know, he's still collecting, even though, uh -huh. you know, we sort of had an agreement with him that he was going to stop collecting. Um, so oh. anyway, so yeah, okay. so that's yeah. kind of a bummer. Okay. Oh. Now you mentioned yeah. Ives, um, but it's still Ann, a great story, you know. <laughs> sure. You mentioned Ann Ives' work. Um, so is he mentioned in one of his? I think it was 2009, if I if I'm remembering correctly. But he mentioned a northern population and a southern population for the Forstens tortoise, and um, one and he, he hypothesized that that. Um, the southern population was smaller and had the nuchal scute oh, yeah, to question. to kind of get around in the sh shrubbery. Um, is that? Are you hearing any more about that or any? I mean, it's tough because there's not many being found. So how do you substantiate that? But is that what you hear about the locals, or were you in the southern or northern population? So I I actually saw forestands in um, in both areas um we found the one um it, that we the one i'm talking about in the uh southern population so like in palu area and it's definitely a different climate it's a lot uh, a lot warmer and a lot um a little bit drier in palu than it is in the in the northern area so um yeah, the one that we, well, we didn't find one in the northern area, but we have a family that we worked with, um, a former hunter that we work mm -hmm. with, and he, you know, used to, he finds them all the time. And they definitely are bigger um, in the northern portion. Um, you know, honestly, I can't really remember about the whole nuchal scoot thing. It, you know, it wasn't sort of something that I was necessarily paying attention to because, 
you know, we were at this point just trying to find tortoises. Um, but I do know that any that we saw that were in captivity, um, there were some with nuchal scoots and some without. Mm. Um, so my thought is that a lot of the ones we saw in captivity were in the southern portion. And I highly doubt that they came from the northern portion. So I don't really know. I don't really have any you know, concrete information on that. And it's definitely something that um, is a really interesting question, but I feel at this point, we really can't, uh, I can't even hypothesize about it because, um, uh, you know, the, we don't have enough enough data or enough information, um, you know, enough tortoises to look at to yeah. really make a, yeah. you know, a determination. But hopefully, you know, maybe down the road in a couple of years, or, you know, once, you know, we find more of a population, um, then, you know, we can look at that, you know, as one of our, you know, one of our, the uh, one of our research questions. Awesome. Cool. Okay. So it's time we're going to go to our feature. I have a million questions for you, Christine, but, but let's, uh, let's go to our first feature, Steve, if you would do the honors. Minto's mailbag. I got to make a new one of those because. I'm embarrassed by that thing. <laughs> yeah, his beard is not where it should be. You're right. Uh, uh, all right. So uh, a couple questions for you. Uh, some is for everybody, actually. But uh, this first one comes from Matthew Hills. Uh, what recommendations do you have for people want, wanting to follow your footsteps in other countries? So, I mean, definitely go for it. You know what I mean? Like, don't give up. Um, there's going to be a lot of setbacks. Um, you know, there's tons of times, like I said, when I got hit in the, with the dury and I was just like, oh, this is done. I'm not doing this anymore. Mm -hmm. But you just kind of have to just, you know, keep focusing and, and do research, especially, um, you know, working in other countries. Um, you know, find out what their protocols are. Maybe talk to other researchers who have already done, um, uh, you know, done um uh, projects in these countries. And that's what I did. I talked to a couple other people who, um, who had done research in Indonesia. So, you know, they kind of gave, gave me a breakdown of, you know, what to expect and what you'll need for the permit. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, don't, don't give up, you know, I, I'm obviously, I'm glad that, um, you know, I didn't give up and, and it, it won't be easy, but I would, you know, if it's something you're passionate about, then just, you know, you just got to go for it and deal with, you know, all the issues that, that arise. Okay. Awesome. Uh, second question. So you had said earlier that you went to, when you were getting the permits, you had to spend a few days in Jakarta, right? Yeah. Yeah. So during that time, yep. did you, did you see like the infamous, infamous, like, uh, you know, black, black market animals, like on the streets and stuff? Yeah. You know, I didn't go to, um, just any of the markets really. Um, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, I don't like to see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it, it's 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 difficult for me to, to see that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we did go to a couple of just, um, uh, you know, like sort of street ones, yeah. um, like smaller ones, uh, a lot of birds. You know, they're, okay. they're really into collecting birds and selling birds. Um, Turtle-wise, what did we see? We saw some radiated tortoises. Um, um Sorry, somebody at my door. <laughs> uh, we talked to, we saw some radiated tortoises, um, uh, some Aldabra tortoises. Um, uh, what else? Uh, some diamondback terra, some diamondback terrapins. We saw. Oh, interesting! Yeah, wow. yeah. We, now that I remember, yeah. Okay, so we did go to a couple of um, like pet stores, um, mm -hmm. basically looking for forestins, and we saw That's tons, you know, out, tons yeah. of forestins. Yeah, tons of Forstens. Um, I think I went to four pet stores and, um, oh my gosh, somebody's at my door. Sorry. I'm right back. Go get it. I was good. I was going to say, do you think, do you think they're going to knock again? <laughs> this is epic. This has never no, happened before. Great. Here's somebody in there. If it's, it's somebody dressed up as a forest. Sorry guys. Awesome. It's so uh, just a little, I live in a back house. So my landlords live in the front house and they have like a 13 year old daughter and she, she was just bringing me my mail. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay. Anyway. That's I'm very nice of her. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. She's the sweetest thing. And I moved in like five years ago and, um, so, you know, she was a lot younger and she would come in all the time and she loved, I have bearded dragons 
and she loved to, uh, you know, hold my beardies and she'd bring all our friends over and, and talk about my tortoises and teach them things. And so she's a really, really sweet little girl. But um, anyway, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Um, Pet stores, you saw a ton of Corsons. Yeah. Yeah. So we saw, I mean, every pet store we went into, there were at least like four or five, um, you know, Corsons for sale, mostly small ones, you mm. know, like, um, juveniles things like that i know a couple you, of adults as well do you think um, you were wild caught animals there or do you proceed oh most like definitely Catherine? yeah okay oh no no well the, i mean the thing with um uh with, with forsens is that they're not protected so it, i mean they can be collected so it's you know it's oh, not gosh. like anybody's doing anything you know anything illegal yeah. and the same same with you they're not protected either but Uwanawai has a, a zero quota, so they can't be um, they can't be exported. Um, but Forst and I, they just raised the quota back up this year, and now it's it went down to 135 last mm-hmm. year, and they raised it back up to 150. And basically, I, I one of my counterparts work for LEAPI, which is the um, their their um, governmental research organization, and he said. One of the reasons they raised it is, you know, they had that big earthquake and tsunami um, in 2000, 2018. And he said they raised it because, you know, people may have, um, uh, you know, lost their income on, you know, jobs that maybe went away because of the earthquake and tsunami. So they're giving them the opportunity to collect or even to eat, you know, if because the food supply um, you know, suffered as well from the earthquake. So, um, so they raised, you know, raised the quota back up to 150. So, you know, it's really difficult to, yeah, to try and protect a species that, um, is not protected. Yeah, sure. (laughs) You know, so, yeah. yeah. And you talked about the the medical, um, I I apologize, the, the medical, um care that, that you got costing a dollar forty. So what is a forced in tortoise in a pet store, a wild collected forced in tortoise in a pet store going for? So you know it's interesting. The first year I went, we found uh came across two hunters and they had just collected two tortoises and they were um probably like sub adults and they offered them to us for ten dollars. Wow. Um yeah ten dollars for the two of them. Mm-hmm. And in the pet store, they were going for probably about maybe ten to fifteen dollars, and this was in two thousand two thousand seventeen. So now this guy I was talking about, the one that I told you, you know, took us out into the field and and sells tortoises. Well, I don't know what's happened over the last year, but um, I don't know. Forstens have become extremely valuable and more people want them Mm -hmm. and he was selling them for i think it was about 200 us dollars which is a ridiculous amount for for indonesia i mean you know things over there are not expensive you know i mean for instance i spent a hundred i mean a dollar 40 you know for medical care right um so yeah, I mean, and he's selling them, you know, people are spending that kind of money. So, so their value has really, really increased. They're extremely popular, um, popular pet in Indonesia, um, in Sulawesi and also like in, in West Java. So in Jakarta, Bogor area, you know, things like that. So, um, you know, so they do ship them, you know, ship them within Bali as well. So they will ship. Um, but yeah, they are extremely popular. Um, and Yeah. But it's it's a critically endangered animal, and if so many people have them there, why is it so hard to find them in the wild? Yeah, I was going to ask that too. Yeah, I mean, well, that's the thing. <laughs> um, you know, it seems like yeah, all these hunters are are you know knowing where to go to find them, but mm-hmm. you know, you have to find the right hunters to work with. You know, obviously, the hunters that we thought we could work with, they're not reliable. Um, but it, you know, you have to find the right group of people you know, to go look for, to go look for these tortoises. Yeah. Um, but even if you ask, um, like there, there's one family, 100 that we work with up in the uh, Northern part of Sulawesi and he's been, you know, he's hunted forced and I for, I don't know, 20 years. And he said, 
you know, 10 years ago, he would go out, you know, and find maybe 20 tortoises in a week. He said now he's lucky. Well, he doesn't hunt anymore, but he said, you know, he does go out to look for them, though, just, you know, to, to see them because he appreciates them now. Um, he maybe finds maybe if he's lucky one or two a week. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, so it's, it's, I mean, obviously, like I said, it, they're difficult to find if you, you know, if you don't know where to look, if you don't, you know, know exactly, you know, what time to go, things like that. Um, but even if you ask all the hunters there, it's definitely been a huge decline over the last decade. Um, you know, and, and a lot of people don't hunt them as much anymore because it's not, it's not as profitable. You know, if you're, if you're going out, uh, you know, in a week, 10 years ago, and you're finding 20, but now you're going out and finding one or two a week, that's not going to put food on your table, or that's not going to make you a lot of profit. Um, right. So yeah, I mean, obviously, they're still out there, likely in higher elevations, probably. So, you know, people are looking lower elevations, easier to get to. Um, but they have been known to occur in, you know, in higher elevations. So, but, you know, I think once people deplete the lower elevations, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna obviously move to the higher elevation. So right. yeah, that's what they do with giant tortoises, also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, they're gonna. Yeah. So that plays into my and, next and, question, actually. Oh, sorry. Here, go, keep going. Oh no, I was just gonna say, you know, the government, you know, we, they're just, they're not gonna give them protection unless there's some data showing that, you know, word of mouth or you know, us saying, oh, well, we're talking to people and and the numbers are declining. You know, they want hard evidence. They want mm -hmm. um, actual data. Um, before they'll do anything. So that's why this project, um, you know, this project is so important, um, you know, to actually get that data. That's, you know, an, to, yeah, to that's like an the ongoing data. issue with, with just about anything involving these animals, regardless yeah. of species, is they just, and I understand, I get why they have to do certain things, you know, but it's just waiting too long. You know, all, all of exactly. these, regardless of the species that we're talking about, you're talking about an animal that lives forever or should live forever, takes forever right. to mature. And by the time something is put in concrete, that's it. You know, now you're not seeing two a it's week, you're late. seeing two a month, you know. Exactly. Kevin, it's go too late at your, that point. Uh, and it, next question? Yeah. Uh, these two questions are going to tie into each other, the next two. The first one is, uh, I didn't know that about the elevation for horse needs, actually. So for people that keep captive bred animals, this is for everybody, because I just, I'm ignorant, I don't know this. Does barometric pressure play into things for that? Like, could... Potentially could force us do better if they were living at a higher altitude, say up in like Colorado versus in Connecticut, which is I'm on the shoreline. You know, I don't think that's going to affect it as much, you know, it, weather wise, you know, like more humid environments. Yeah, I don't think the elevation is okay. because, like I said, they are in lower elevations as well. Um, I think if you have captains for captive four stands, you know, you need to consider more your temperature, um, your humidity. I, I think things like that are going to play a bigger role in whether or not they do well, um, okay. you know, well or not. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, I'm trying to. I mean, I lived in in Colorado, but I didn't have four stands then. But I can't. You know, I, I can't. Say, I'm sorry, guys. But, <laughs> Good night. Oh, I'll see you in the morning. Good Sorry. night. <laughs> no, that's fine. She's get it torch. together, Veda. <laughs> I'll tell you tomorrow, Anthony. Come on. Uh, you see my kids walking out here right now. I'm just kidding. I love you so much. I'm totally kidding. I was going to bring I one of my bearded dragons you. with me, yeah. but you can if you want. But uh, sure they're can. both roommate. Well, they're both they're both roommating. They're sleeping. Uh, so. And none of my tortoises are going to sit still, so I didn't feel like bringing one yeah. of those would. Do you don't want to get pooped. You don't want to get pooped on, <laughs> on air. That's yeah. true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, so my final question, and it may not, it's not going to be the final question tonight, but mine for the mailbag is, uh, this comes from Andrew at uh, Arizona Tortoise, Com Tortoise Compound. Andrew! Hi, Christina. Andrew! <laughs> <laughs> Christina, what are your views on captive breeding, and is it needed with horse and tortoise, horse and tortoises and why? Oh, most definitely. I think, uh, you know, like you mentioned, they're critically endangered. Um, according to IUCN, they're still listed as endangered because um, there's no one who can actually release the the red list assessment. I worked on the assessment, so they are technically critically endangered. It just hasn't been released yet. Um, yeah, without a doubt. Sorry. 
Steve's talking um, to us. Nobody can hear him. Yes, I, I know. That was the first time. That he, that it kind of caught, I was just See? like, where is that? I was like, where is that voice coming from? Um, 53 minutes in, he decided to hit you with a bomb. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it totally, totally threw me off. Um, yeah. I, so, it, it always happens. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't even know what he said, but um, I don't, I don't think it's been released. That he said it's in the update. I don't think the assessment has been, been released. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, so yes, yeah, so so I did work on the assessment, which was cool, um, and they are technically critically endangered. So captive breeding, yes, definitely. Um, uh, oh, okay. Okay, so um, yeah, so, without a doubt. I mean, I, I I think that the imports of Forced and I have really dropped off. I know recently there's been quite a few, um, you know, people, if they see them, they, they send them to me. Um, so I, I have noticed that recently within the last month or so, there have been people importing them. Um, I can't remember the person's name off the top of my head. Um, but anyway, but I know it's not as much as it used to be in the past. I mean, I yeah. know... You know, they, they were yeah, they imported all the time. So, a relatively, I mean, maybe more so than relatively, but pretty rare tortoise to, you just don't really see them popping up, you know, that much. Yeah, it. yeah, not as much anymore. Yeah, like I said, just in the last month or so, though, there's been, and you know what, they could actually be the same group. It's just different people trying to sell them. Mm -hmm. And they're also selling, trying to sell them for these crazy prices. I, I don't know, what was it, $2,000 for a pair or something? Wow. I mean, I, yeah, it was ridiculous uh, price that they were, you know, charging for these tortoises. Um, so, yeah, captive reading for Forrest and I definitely, um, you know, they do well. You know, they do, you know, really well in captivity. Um, as long as you have the right, you know, right conditions, they're fairly hardy. Um and they're a really cool species, you know. They're they're pretty personable. Um, they can be little jerks, you know. They, you know, I have small ones, and they, um, you know, they headbutt each other. Um, you know, even the smallest one will headbutt the bigger one. Um, but they're they're a really cool species. So yeah, no captive breeding of forest ends is um, definitely a must. And I had the stud book, so um, you know, I got a lot of people into the stud book as well when I had it. Um, I think there were more private individuals actually um, once I finished the stud book than uh, ACA institutions that were, you know, that were participating. So, so that was really cool. It was a lot more people participating in the stud book right now, um, which I think is, you know, really good. So yeah, no, totally for uh, captive breeding for students. Yeah. I hope to do it one day, minor, you know, when mine are older, but it's going to be a while. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now, can we take this now and and go a little bit rapid fire? We spend a lot of time on Sulawesi and and forest and tortoises specifically, which is such an important topic. So I'm happy that we did, but you know, I I do want to talk to you a little bit about kind of how you got to where you are today, a little bit more about your journey. I'm really interested in your, you know, degree in psychology and how that works into things even today, that sort of thing. So can you talk a little bit like. How did Christine get from those younger days in New York to into conservation, animals in general? What did that journey look like early on? Yeah, so, um, yeah, like I said, I grew up in New York, went to high school and college in Manhattan. So, I, I mean, I'm a city girl. I never went out looking for tortoises or uh, turtles when I was young. Um, I, I My love of animals sort of started i used to go to florida all the time with uh you know with my family and we went to ocean world i think it was called and they had this pool um you know with dolphins in it and i would literally like spend the entire day at this pool just playing you know playing with the dolphins so so that sort of got me into um you know wanting to maybe work with animals but you know like i said i grew up in new york so i graduated from college um psychology. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I, you know, I switched from finance. Um, so I moved to California with, uh, with an ex-boyfriend at the time. And, um, you know, I was doing some office work and one day I decided that I wanted to get into marine biology. So, um, uh, yeah. So, you know, sort of when I get something in my mind, I, mm -hmm. I just like, I do it, you know, I, I, whatever it takes, I do it. So I wanted to be a marine biologist. So I started doing research and um, I started volunteering at a small aquarium uh, in California. 
um, uh, volunteer there, got a part-time job there, sort of worked my way into a larger aquarium, um, was a, became an aquarist there. Um, I also move for work. So uh, I moved to Georgia. I worked at the Georgia Aquarium uh, for about five years. And my last aquarium was um, uh, Denver Aquarium, uh, downtown aquarium, Denver. So while I was there, um, I guess I started there 2010. <clears throat> so while I worked there, I uh, had an Asian turtle exhibit. So this was sort of my first, you know, I mean, I worked with sea turtles before, um, but this was my first, you know, freshwater turtle exhibit. And um, we had a sick uh, painted terrapin. Um, long story short, uh, he had ingested um, gravel. So we had to do surgery. Um, so they removed a portion of his plastron. And um, when they went to put it back on, it didn't quite fit right. So uh, the area went necrotic, the plastron portion fell off. Um, so I took him home and rehabbed him for about, I think, six months in my house. And um, yeah, and, and ever since, we have a really cute picture. I don't know if Steve can put it up, but <laughs> of of the the terrapin that I worked with. Um, so anyway, was that so, a full grown uh, male? Um, he was. Um, he was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's and, one. So um, that's the species that gets the really beautiful mm -hmm. um, coloration on the head. Yes. Yeah. yeah there you go. So that's the there little the cool. little guy I worked with. Yeah, he was the sweetest thing. I named him Lovebug. <laughs> Actually, I presented. <laughs> My first TSA conference, um, I presented on the work I did with with that terrapin. Um, so yeah, so working with him, I just decided that I wanted to do turtle conservation, and um, so I went to TSA. I uh, 2012 presented um, on the work that I did with him, and I met uh, Eric Eric Good from the, from the TC and Paul Gibbons, Dr. Gibbons. And uh, so that was in August. Uh, long story short, I did an internship, like kind of a working internship at the TC in October of that year. And then in January of the following year, I started working at the TC. So um, yeah, so it was actually, you know, pretty quick, um, you know, got into turtle conservation uh, pretty, pretty quickly. You know, it worked out really well for me, um, you know, from August, the TSA conference, um, to January when I started at the TC. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So that's sort of how I got into, um, into turtle conservation. I mean, honestly, at this point, you know, I thought I'd work my way up in the aquarium world. You know, I was assistant curator at the Denver Aquarium and I figured, oh, you know, I'll become curator, maybe director of a, you know, of an aquarium one day. And nope. Then that terrapin came into my life, <laughs> into my life. And, uh, <laughs> And yeah, so then I sort of veered off again into um, into turtle conservation. So yeah, so here yes, I am. I love it. That's, a <laughs> that's yeah. really cool. That's yeah. Cool. yeah. Do you? Yeah. That's an important turtle. It's a very important turtle right there. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It kind of changed. Um, that one turtle kind of changed, um, you know, changed my traje trajectory of my life again. So. Do you feel that your, um, your, so, so to me, like you we talk about kind of how you've had a, a different story than some of the other folks who are like leading this type of charge around the world. And I see somebody who's like well-spoken, captivating. We, we liked your, we loved your, your talk. Part of that is, is you, you're the one selling it. Right. And, and you've got your psychology degree. So, so you're a talented on some level, you have to be a talented people person to be able to, to, to do what you do and be who you are. But now you're in a world of kind of bookworm, really intelligent people, animal people who maybe lack the, the, people skills sometimes do you think that that gives you like an interesting unique place in this world where you bring something unique to the table because that's the sort of stuff that really gets me excited sorry yeah i mean i mean to be honest you know to be honest i think um i think i'm kind of shy and i have some you know like i'm i don't like presenting i get super super nervous about it um so I don't think I'm very, like, I, I don't know why I chose psychology. Um, I think I did because it was my minor. 
And I really just wanted to graduate. And I, I was like failing all my finance classes. So I was just like, well, I got to do something, you know, so I just switched, you know, I took two years off. Um, and then I just switched to psychology. So I don't think I ever really wanted to necessarily go into psychology and deal with people. Um, I, I definitely like animals a lot more than I like people anyway. So, <laughs> you know, so um, that's definitely. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I think I'm more sort of like you people, you know, like you, like you said, you know, sort of you people. What are you trying to you say? You know, I like, yeah. You, you well, like, no, I, I like being Steve. a part of that whole thing. I I much rather hang out with my tortoises and yeah. my bearded dragons than go out and um, yeah. So so I think I sort of this is a good place for me to be. You know, my I mean, I can be very outgoing and. Um, and friendly, um, but I also am sort of introverted too. So I don't mind, you know, just it's being that sort of, exactly, exactly. Yes. I get overwhelmed too, if there's like too many people or, or I need a break from it. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think this is, a, you know, where I belong, <laughs> I guess I would say. That's really cool. I have yeah. a question for you from yeah. the chat also. Uh, so this is from Steven Fuentes. I don't know if I'm saying your name right. I apologize if I'm not. Uh, oh, hi, Steven. Hello. Hi, Steven. Uh, so he asks, how can <laughs> we help you as the viewers? But before you say that, I want to say one last one thing real quick. Steve just put up a GoFundMe for a uh, Stop Turtle Races. I've never seen this before. Um, and they're only $24 away from hitting their goal of $20,000. Yeah, so we haven't even talked about my other project. Yeah. Right. Is this your project? Oh, that's right. That's right. The Turtle Races. Yeah. Yeah. Nice, Kev. I know Alex. Nice. $24. Alex. Let's hit it. Yeah, Alex Let's... is going to be like really bummed. I haven't talked about turtle races yet. <laughs> oh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Okay. There's two two things okay. I wanted to get yeah. to, and that's one of them. Yeah. But please go ahead. Tell us about the turtle races. Okay. And how we can help you. Oh. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. so, so, if it's something else. Money always helps, obviously. Um, so, <laughs> we didn't really talk about. We didn't we didn't really talk about the about the issues I had with Sulo SE. Um, yeah, I mean, it was there was a lot of issues. And, you know, I think a lot of them uh, sort of stem from the fact that I don't have a background in biology or, um, you know, I'm very new to the field. You know, I mean, technically, I've only been doing turtle working with turtles um, for what? eight years, eight years, I guess. And, you know, like a lot of, a lot of you, a lot of these other people have been doing it for, I don't know, your whole life. So, you know, so I think that caused a lot of red flags with people, or maybe some people thought that, um, you know, I shouldn't be doing this and, you know, because there's other people or other organizations that should be doing it, you know, they have more experience, whatever. So, so anyway, so, I guess last year the Sulawesi project ended, you know, there was a lot of issues. Um, my counterparts, um, you know, I, I wasn't getting um, how, uh, like uh, agreement sign that we needed. They're very big on like MOUs and things like that. So, um, you know, organization I was working with here, we just really weren't vibing very well. So, so basically bottom line is the project ended. Um, I went to Sulawesi in November of last year, sort of to say goodbye to everybody because, you know, I had made like, like great friends there, you know, like family. I, ha I have another photo um, of this, a group of us that, um, you know, I consider them my family. I talk to them all the time. They're, you know, they used to hunt Uwanawai. He doesn't hunt them anymore. And, and he says it's because of me and what I've taught him. So, um, you know, these people, I, I grew to love them. So, uh, so anyway, so I went back in November to sort of say goodbye to everybody, you know, have a last trip to Sulawesi and, um, you know, it was super sad. Um, it was really difficult to think, you know, that the project was ending for me. Um, anyway, sorry. Uh, you know, cause I had kind of dedicated years, you know, years to this project. And, um, so, okay. So anyway, I come back from Sulawesi and I'm just like, well, what am I going to do now? You know, it's like, 
I, I want to still work with turtles. So, um, so Alex Heave, who runs the Turtle Race Task Force, he uh, was recruiting for volunteers to uh, to help him out with this project that he's working on. And he had started the project um, when he was in high school, so uh, like ten years ago. And um, but he was in high school, you know, he's he's a young kid. Um, he really you know, couldn't get things going. So somebody suggested, oh, you should, you know, get this project going again. So I came across his post on Facebook and was just like, oh, cool. You know, this is another project I could work on. It's with box turtles, which um, I love box turtles. It's actually the first turtle I had was, um, uh, was a box turtle, an ornate box turtle. So um, I was like, okay, I'll get involved. Um, you know, I'll get involved in this project. This sounds, you know, it's, it's animal welfare sort of, um, you know, I'm vegan. So, you know, so I, I, you know, animal welfare is, is important to me. Um, so yeah, so that's basically how I got involved in, um, in the turtle race project. And within that few months, I guess I got back from Sulawesi in November and, um, I got involved in the turtle races probably December or January. And then Sulawesi started again because I, like I said, I don't really give up. You know, I sort of, I'm not going to give up on things. So I'm just like, there's got to be a way for me to, you know, continue this project. Um, so I'm now working with a local organization in Sulawesi. It's run by two um, young women conservationists. They're based in Sulawesi. Um, they, w we have a team now who, um, who lives in Habitat and they've done um, uh, three rounds of surveys already for Forest and I again. So uh, yeah, so, the, so then Sulawesi started back up. So now I have these two projects, um, these two projects that I'm working on. Um, so yeah, so it's been a bit overwhelming getting them, you know, working on both of them, but, um, but yeah, so, so turtle races, yeah. So, um, you know, again, growing up in New York, I had no idea what a turtle race was. I mean, you know, there's none, you know, in my area. So, uh, you know, talking to Alex and, and doing some more research, um, it's basically staggering um, how many races there are and what goes on at these races. Uh, so there's about 600 races across the country. Uh, it's in about 28 states. And, um, yeah, I mean, do you guys know? Do you guys know about about these races? No, um, I, I'm have you heard I'm, about them? I'm reading right now. Yeah, no, I, I actually yeah. you know, don't know really much anything about. It. I didn't know people even still did this with them. You know, the last I had heard about it was like, my God, oh yeah, maybe seven years ago. Somebody asked me. I can't remember who it was, but somebody asked me uh, if I would because uh, I, I do all the rescue for my, most of the rescue for my state. And it's obviously primarily red red sliders that get ditched or surrendered. And somebody had asked me, right. they saw a post or something saying, uh, you know, we see that you've taken a lot of red red sliders. Would you be willing to offer some up for turtle racing? Uh, and this was somewhere down South oh my gosh. and yeah. no, I obviously did not do it, but that was the last I'd even heard any, anything about this. Yeah. Um, well, the main issue with, with turtle races yeah. is that they're, it's like a rattlesnake roundup. You're going out and catching these wild box turtles for the race. And then they're just, whatever's happening to them is happening. And then you get the mixing of the genetics because all these box turtles came from all these different areas and they're just, and are now being oh, released okay. wherever or kept or, you know, no matter what happens, it's going to be bad. Once they're taken out of the wild, that's just bad. Mm -hmm. So it's that added wrinkle, but please, Christine. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So basically they're, you know, collecting turtles for these races, you know, maybe weeks or months in advance. They're keeping them in, in awful conditions. Um, and then race day comes. So, you know, these are mostly uh, in the summertime. So around festivals, you know, 4th of July, there's about, there's over a hundred races on the 4th of July Jeez. that happen across the country. Yeah. And if we, you know, some some people take the turtles from one race to another, um, but there's some races that have over 400 turtles entered into them, and they're mostly box oh. turtles, uh, mostly three toads, um, uh, not 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 too many ornates, um, and yeah, so there's about 600, and so once race day comes, you know they're raced in the heat of the day, so they're mm -hmm. usually you know like in the middle of the day on concrete or asphalt. So, you know, the, the ground is um, like over a hundred degrees. 
Uh, the turtles are painted. I have some photos, like um, maybe if, if Steve wants to, um, just to show some of the conditions that the turtles are kept in. Um, um, if, hey, anyway, I want you to know um, somebody donated money yeah. to hit your goal. Hey. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah. We, we were $24 away from uh, our $20,000 goal. So that's awesome. Now you're 25 yeah, over. So, just remember that the podcast yeah. helped oh, you do that. Oh, it's over? So it, more than 20000 Yeah. Wow. You can keep going. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's awesome. <laughs> so, who did, um, Do you know who donated it? See, oh, uh, see, Kevin, Kevin did somebody say it? Uh, let me refresh and see. It was Eric That's Roth, a Blandings. Eric Roth and Obang. Blandings, sorry. Yeah. Right. And what, there's a, I think there's a, I got questions. a photo Go of wood sorry. turtles. I think there's photos of wood. I think I posted some photos of wood turtles uh, being, I just, yeah. being used. There is nowhere in the Blanding's turtles range, same thing with the North American wood turtle, where they can be removed for any reason whatsoever. So it's who's not, you know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? Who's not, uh, it's almost like shame on some of these states for not. Oh. Yeah, some of those pictures, but. Um... Oh, yeah. Well, that's the thing. You know, it, it doesn't seem to be, you know, a lot of the state biologists or, um, you know, the, the, the state authorities, they're not regulated. They're not monitored. Like nobody's keeping track of these things. Um, so that's why this project is really important. So, um, you know, basically what our plan is, uh, well, this year we were supposed to start, but obviously COVID. Um, oh, my God. Yeah, that's one of the conditions. That, yeah. Yeah, and there was also a photo um, of somebody hot gluing an American flag to the carapace of a box turtle. America. Uh, yeah. Jeez. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I you know I don't <laughs> want to say where these races are, but mm -hmm. you know they're you know Oklahoma, Kansas, um, you know Illinois, places you know places. Anyway. <laughs> Um, so I mean, I uh, think you should say exactly where they are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't want yeah, to say, yeah. but I will. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. That's there's crazy. the hot glue. I mean, they're hot gluing American flag to the back of a to the carapace of a of a box turtle. Yeah, it's what a proud sickening. moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that would yeah. put a lot. Of drag and and on these it, are so. you know these yeah. races have been around for. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just. That's true. He's not going to win. So e even like the whole concept, you know, they put them all in the middle in a circle uh, and they paint like a like a, um, a chalk outline and they lift the box. And then the first turtle to exit the the chalk line is the winner. I mean, you know, I guess they don't have much other, you know, things going on during these festivals. So it's, you know, this is very popular. This, You know, people are very adamant about these races and it's very important tradition to them so right. you know trying to get these stopped or regulated is 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 not going to be easy um but basically so what our plan is um we have um as of our last recruitment we have 175 uh volunteers across across the u.s um off the top of my head um i think the only state that we don't have volunteers is i wrote down anybody out there from north dakota there are actually eight races in North Dakota. So we need volunteers there to attend races. Um, so anybody listening knows anybody in North Dakota. Um, so what our plan is, is to have a volunteer at every single turtle race next year and collect what does data. That look like? So how many turtles Collecting are data. Got it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, how many turtles, uh, undercover though, we're, you know, we're not mm -hmm. going to announce what we're doing. So. Uh, you know, photo, you know, photographic evidence, the conditions the turtles are kept in, um, how many turtles are being used, uh, any endangered or protected species. Um, you know, we do know wood turtles are used, uh, the Blandings turtles, um, the ornate box turtle is, is uh, protected in Illinois, and that species is being used as well. So collecting data, um, you know, on, on each race. We also have some veterinarians on um, as volunteers, and uh, we also want to do health assessments on these on some of these species. A lot of the um, 
like after the races, a lot of the turtles are just abandoned. So um, they'll be left in boxes, like you saw. They'll be left in boxes on the side of the road, mm -hmm. or you know, they'll bring them to a body of water and just dump them there. You know, they don't care that they're box turtles. Um, I had another photo of uh, some guy uh, letting people put turtles in the back of his pickup truck. So there's this giant, you know, bed of a pickup truck with very little shade and all these poor turtles are just, you know, clamoring to get to this little shaded area because the sun's beating down on them. Um, so we definitely want to do health assessments to, um, uh, you know, to document stress levels, um, you know, do some disease testing. And that's like sort of phase two. And then, and then phase three is basically, um, will be our community outreach and, um, it, you know, appealing to all the local, uh, like state biologists and organizations to get these races, um, you know, hopefully, I mean, hopefully banned, but at least regulated, uh, mm -hmm. at some sort of, you know, level. So, I think, so that's I think this like is, I said, we were going to start this year. Go ahead. Sorry. Did I no, up? sorry, you, 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 yeah, you froze for a minute. Go ahead, keep going. <laughs> oh, no, no, I was done. Your turn. Oh, okay. You <laughs> um, I was going to say, I think it's really important that, you know, and it's unique that you're doing this because, I mean, even me, like, I didn't, I didn't even know that these things were still going on. So it, it'd be great to bring this to the attention of law enforcement and, and you know, like you were saying, same with the biologists and stuff like that, because when it comes to a lot of things that involve turtles and I guess, you know, mainly turtles in the United States, that uh, it's all, you know, the pet trade, the pet trade, the pet trade, poaching for the pet trade, poaching, but they don't even know that some of these things are going on and they're just as bad, if not worse, you know? So it's, right, exactly. uh, it's, yeah. it's, I, I did forget. Nice. It's, yeah. I did forget to mention that there is a new um, a new safe program for uh, the AZA safe program right, right. for uh, North American turtles, yep. and so the turtle races is now a part of that program. Oh, okay. I didn't, um, I didn't even know. It was yeah. Just... Very cool. That's great. So... Yeah, they. Um, it's it's just sort of implementing now and it's already been a little bit delayed like everything else because of COVID. Um, but turtle races is one of the objectives within this program, which is great because mm -hmm. it's going to bring it to the attention of the AZA community. Um, there's law enforcement that's also involved in the, in the safe program. So it's going to give us a lot more exposure than, um, you know, than we had before, um, you know, just kind of doing it, uh, you know, basically on our own with, um, you know, we have a fiscal sponsor, which is, uh, the Colorado Reptile Humane Society. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, so it's, it's definitely going to give us more exposure, um, being a part of the safe program now. That's great. Awesome. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Have you, have you yeah. personally been like boots on the ground at one of these? I have not. No, okay. I, um, I have never been to one. Um, and like I said earlier, I, um, you know, animal welfare is its really difficult for me to see that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. I honestly, I don't really want to, to go to any of these races. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to likely have to just because, um, you know, I am so involved in the project right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Alex Heeb, who is the director of the project, uh, you know, we kind of work together on writing all the grants um, and things like that. So I, I'm really invested in this project, you know, much like I am in Sulawesi. So, um, you know, I feel that I really do need to, you know, to experience it firsthand. Sure. Um, it's going to be difficult, though. I don't want to see, you know, I don't really want to see that kind of stuff. It's hard for me to look at the photos, Yeah. you know, let alone see it in person. So, yeah, so it's not so, going to be easy. So I'm assuming you know this then. Um for the most part, what are the people doing with the turtles afterwards? I know you said some, they bring them to other races, but are they just, just being like, all right, well, I took this 20 miles from here. I'm going to drop it off here. Do you have any idea of that kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, yeah, a lot of the races, a lot of the race organizers will say to people, oh, please return it, you know, to where you got it from. You know, they imprint on a certain area, but you know, the, these people, they don't, they, they don't really, lazy. it's just, it's just an entertainment, you know, an entertainment thing for them. So, you know, a lot of them are dumped somewhere, um, you know, in, in different areas. And who knows, you know, there might be other populations there that they're impacting. 
um, you know, bringing diseases to that area. So, um, and I mean, who's going to remember, like what person's going to remember, you know, exactly maybe where they found this? Well, that's another thing. A lot of people probably find turtles on the side of the road, right? right. I mean, these, you know, people, they don't know how to find box turtles. Like they're not going out yeah, like yeah. a herper, you know, trying to look for box turtles. They're going to be driving down the road and they're going to see a box box turtle on the side of the road and they're going to say oh there's a race in a month we should grab that turtle you know they're going to bring it home putting it put it in a box and give it some you know iceberg lettuce for a month so yeah. so that's mm -hmm. i you know my personal idea is that's what's happening you know they're just randomly opportunistically finding turtles and um you know keeping them for you know like i said two weeks a month who knows mm -hmm. and then after the race you know just dumping them somewhere so i'm wondering yeah. if these races primarily happen in like pockets where there's large populations. Like for instance, if I'm driving around Connecticut, I'm really, really hard pressed to find like an Eastern box turtle. But for instance, like when right. I went down to visit Chris, like the five mile stretch to his house before his house, I saw like six, you know, which was insane on the road. Yeah. I have a buddy in Tennessee once a week, once a week, you know, he posts a video of him like moving a box turtle across the street. So, yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not too up on the geography of these areas, you know, but they're mostly in very rural, um, you know, rural areas that these races are happening. They're at like festivals, um, you know, like county fairs and festivals. And that's where the races are happening, you know, not in big cities or, or yeah, even sure. near big cities, probably. Yeah, yeah, more rural where you're likely to find more turtles, you know, maybe less. Yeah. Um, human impact, you know, uh, less development, things like that. So, um, yeah. I, you I know, I, I don't think people are probably traveling far to find turtles. Yeah. Um, so they're probably, you know, quite a few in their areas. It's amazing to me how people still decorate or paint the shell of a turtle. And, you know, what's funny is like what Kevin was saying with the, with them, there's a lot of <clears throat> here, luckily, but, uh, the locals here, the old timers still paint their shells, but they're doing it so that you don't hit them with the lawnmowers. That's why they, they don't understand. Oh, that so like they're pets. Oh, yeah. like, so you will yeah. I've come across them several times in the woods and they're, they've got spray paint that's been on them for probably the last 25 years or more. And you know, it's, it's coming off, but it's still like really embedded into the ridges of the, you know, the carapace scoots. And, uh, but you know, they they think they're doing the right thing here. They're spray painting them so that when they mow their lawns, they don't hit them because the, the, there's a very big population of them here. But it, it just, right. seeing those photos reminded me, it's just amazing how many people still paint a turtle yeah. shell. Yeah. Oh. I mean, at least those people are mean well. <laughs> you know, they're trying not to hit them. You know, yeah. these people are using them for races or, you know, just decorating them. And they're, I think they might also have contests like the, you know, the best decorated turtle or the best, oh. you know, yeah. So they're perpetuating yeah. that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Some races say, you know, don't paint the turtles. It's not good for them. But, you know, the majority of them are, are they have little, uh, little care about the turtles themselves. It's just a means of entertainment. You know, they mix them with toad races. You know, they also have, you know, toad races and things like that. Like I think there was another picture of some turtles and toads in the same um, in the same bucket that you know that I had. So yeah, it, they, they just don't, you know, they, they just don't care about yeah. the actual turtles. It's just entertainment. Yeah, entertainment yeah. and tradition, and that's that's important. And, to and tradition, yeah. exactly. Yeah, right. That's tough to yeah. break, and and um, you know, yeah. in, in a ever changing, quick, very quickly changing world. It's mm -hmm. it's natural for for us to really hold on to our traditions and and right. try to keep those keep whatever ones we can um, and and that's an unfortunate part is is trying to work with people who you know their tradition and and their childhood you're taking a piece of that away so being able to work with exactly. someone who doesn't see things the way you do has a completely different perception and doesn't yeah. care what the science is they care about what's important to them, not what's important to you. Yeah. So that's the right, difficulty exactly. that, that you have. So a, a yes. super important project. So as, as we move towards kind of wrapping up the episode, I just want to, 
I just want to say, you know, the Turtle Room is on your side. Reach out, whatever you need. Um, we're willing to use our social media um, outlets to try to, you know, communicate to people in North Dakota to get um, some of our people as boots on the ground, if that helps, and to share the things that you're doing and, and reach out um, a platform if you want to publish on any of the things you're you're seeing in our blog or things like that. Um, whatever we can do to help. Um, Awesome. I feel Thank as you. as excited and energized as, you know, when we watched you talk um, in, in 2018. Um, so the last thing, I would be remiss if I didn't ask. Um, Kevin, Chris, and I each have two daughters, and Steve has cats. And um, <laughs> we do that every time. We do that but, every uh, time. <laughs> I know. I, I just can't not do it's it. It's funny. But, uh, I know. It's just I just have to. I'm sorry. So I'm that guy that repeats jokes now. I'm as I mentioned as I'm mentioning right now. I'm a dad. Exactly. Thank you, Kev. Oh, I so, want to end the episode by the way with a, a great dad reptile joke. Okay, oh, so sure. hold on to that because because we're not there yet. But I just want to. I, I just I just want to ask you about like being a a female in a very male dominated arena. And, and like, I, you know, I want, I can't wait till my daughters get a little older and they, and I could tell them to, to tune in, to see, to see people like you, to see strong women like you who are, are, you get your mindset on something and nothing's going to stop you and you just keep working at it. Yeah. And, and it's so inspiring and, and it's something that I want to see more of. So I get so excited. Um, with the work that you're doing, I'm just wondering if you could speak to, you know, what it's like to be, um, to be a woman in this, in this world and, you know, maybe a little bit of what the challenges are like, or, you know, kind of just what that's like, because obviously yeah. on this male dominated show that you're on right now, for instance, I think that that's a really important thing that we can't give to people. So I'm asking you if you would be interested in, in sharing some of that with us. Yeah. So, I mean, I think one of the things that helped me a lot was that I am older, <laughs> you know, than a, than a lot of, you know, people or, or women, girls who are trying to get into the industry. So, um, you know, I, I've had a lot of experiences in my life. I've dealt with a lot of things. Um, so that definitely helps. Um, you know, I, I'm, you know, more secure with myself and, and I've experienced a lot. So it's, I think it was easier for me as an older woman coming into the field. And, um, you know, it, it, it's really intimidating. Like I remember my first TSA conference. Um, I mean, I didn't know anyone, you know, I mean, I had talked to Rick Hudson, um, one time on the phone cause I had raised some money for, uh, for their project, uh, with Joko with, for the Batiger. Um, but I mean, I came in knowing no one. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I think, um, you know, if it's if it's something that you're passionate about, um, you know, you you just have to um, you just have to stick with it. You know, you you just can't give up, and there, it's going to be difficult. Like it was super difficult. Like I said, um, I didn't, you know, really get into too much. Um, a little bit about you know Sulawesi and. Um, but it was hard, you know, it was really, really hard, but, um, it, you know, and I think things are getting better. You know, I think things are, are progressing a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's it, like, you just can't give up, you know what I mean? Like you, you just have to push forward, um, you know, try and find like a, a core group of people. Um, you know, I, I enjoy working with smaller, smaller organizations now than, you know, larger ones. I think, um, you know, larger ones have, um, sort of different agendas than small organizations. Um, you know, there's more egos involved, there's more, um, uh, you know, reputation and, and, you know, who's, well, we want, who's doing what and taking credit for, other people's work and things like that. And, um, you know, and, and, and also, um, you know, you, you don't have to necessarily work with these larger organizations. You know, there, there are great small organizations out there like you guys, you know, that are very inclusive and, and, um, you know, uh, will, will work with anybody and, and don't, you know, it doesn't matter your gender or, um, you know, how much experience you've had and, uh, you know, and, and also a little karma too, you know, like uh, with Sulawesi, um, you know, when the project ended, um, 
you know, no one was going to do it. You know, it wasn't like, um, you know, somebody else was going to take over the project and get it done. So, um, you know, I, I kind of wanted to prove, uh, you know, prove some people wrong that I could do this, <laughs> you know, I, I could keep this project going. And, uh, so, yeah, so, you know, a little bit of, um, you know, sort of, of karma and, you know, you know, a little, a little bit of revenge that, you know, you can do this, like, mm-hmm. you know, like, sorry. Yeah. It, it's, it's hard, you know, difficult to, um, topic to talk about. Um, but you know, if, if it's something that you want, you know, like tell your daughters, you just have to go for it um, mm-hmm. and find those people who will support you. You know, there are people out there who will support you. Not everyone's going to turn on you or not everyone, right. um, you know, is, is not going to give you an opportunity. Like you'll find somebody to give you an opportunity or somebody that will work with you. Um, so, you know, you just you just have to keep going and, and, and make it work. That's yeah. Yeah, I love it. it but I it's not it. easy. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't thank you enough for for sharing that with us for for being here. Yeah. Kevin, do you have a do you have a joke that you wanted to tell? Is that yeah, happen? An, an end joke. It's, <laughs> it's so happy. Uh, I really like Daddy. You know, uh, I love when you can see goes, his teeth. He's so happy. Yeah, that's why he's so right. happy right now. That's when you know. Uh, first though, you got another donation from Chris Drake for uh, you are now at. $20,000, Thank so. you, Chris. Awesome. Oh my gosh. Awesome. Yay. Yeah. So That's cool. Great. So much guys. This is a cool another, we, we do have, we do have some turtle room people, um, as volunteers. Uh, Miranda mm-hmm. is one of awesome. our volunteers and, uh, Andy. Awesome. So Andy Weber. Awesome. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah. So, yeah. So you guys are, you guys are involved and now, you know, hopefully more of you guys, you know, we can kind of work together. And, you know, I also would love to work with you guys, um, you know, Sulawesi too, because that's, uh, you know, that's important to you guys as well, working with, um, you know, with Forston. So, so yeah, we need to talk more after, after the, po- after the podcast. Yeah, cool. That sounds good. All right. You're taking notes yeah. back there, Steve. I know you are. All right, Kev, hit us with it. Here we go. You ready for this, everybody? Nope. Not at all. We're ready. Why, why can't you hear a pterodactyl urinate? I don't know why. Because the P is, is silent. silent. Come on, man. Oh, you just oh, can't. Oh, gosh. I don't want him to know it. It's my <laughs> punchline. too line. easy. You got to let him That's have easy. the punchline. That's a good man. one. My, That's a good one. It's something I'm pretty decent at. My kids, my my wife and kids hate me for it. That I can, I can, I can often. I won't say, I won't say like majority of the time because it's not, but I can often guess more often than I probably should can guess the, those corny jokes. All right. Here's the test then. What do you yeah. call an alligator in a vest? Mm-hmm. I don't know. We're on air, so I don't want to think about it too long, but an I would take probably. Yeah, there you go. Ah, oh my gosh. Uh, I like, I, I like that one. That's a good this, one. That's good. That's uh, great. I really <laughs> love these. That's, I hate them. But I'm That's a really good one. I think it's the worst. I've got ones on par with that, but they have nothing to do with reptiles. So, so we'll be back here next month. Kevin won't be invited, but we'll be <laughs> hey. back here next month for hey, another you're episode. Bucks. You got another donation. Come on. Yeah. What? Oh, bang came Man, back. I should have started a... That's $50. That's awesome. I should have started oh, a you. GoFundMe for Sulawesi, too. We should have done yeah. both of them. <laughs> oh, well. Next time. Oh. Next time. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, this is terrific. See, this is this is what it felt like in, at TTPG, how we started the show, talking about what a great feeling it was. It's just mm-hmm. your work is super inspiring, and um, we can't thank you enough for being here. So thank you so much, Christine. Thank you so much for thank having you. me. Sorry, I got a little emotional, but that's that's hey, just no, me. that's good. That's, that's good. Just yeah. me. That's yeah. really I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't don't ever it's change good. or apologize good. for motion for is good. I won't. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. I think that's what gets awesome. me through. So yeah. All right. All right, guys. Thanks, guys. Have a nice evening. Okay, bye, guys.